Hi, Matt. Hey, Kristen. How are you? I'm doing all right. How are you? I am doing swell. It's a great, uh, great autumn we somehow managed to end up. Oh, that's with. my favorite season. Well, no, um, I, I wish I could work outside. I'm considering trying to take a laptop and just going sitting out on the mall somewhere and making that my uh, my office for the day. <laughs> it is great. I guess that um, tropical storm or whatever that uh, that hit DC uh, maybe ushered in some some cool weather. So. Yeah. What was it? It wasn't, it didn't, was it officially, I don't think it was a hurricane here, was it, officially? Uh, probably not. I mean, usually once they hit, the eye goes over land, it dramatically, uh, weakens. So, yeah, my, I, I, I wasn't here for it, so I, I don't have any first-hand accounts. Um, I, I had gotten out of town, but, yeah. uh, yeah, you I don't, probably I, I mean, vacationing I like, uh, damage. I didn't see any damage. I had a friend whose house, they had a tree in their backyard go down, but that was it. Uh. And of course, Bill, uh, what's his name? Cher, I think, is on. He's on assignment again, uh, so we don't know where he is. We assume he's on a beach somewhere. So, <laughs> from the right and the right and the far right, I guess. <laughs> yes. Um, so anyway, but a uh, lot to talk about today. Obviously, you've got this controversy controversy over Obama speeches and all that. But um, I did want to talk about some old. Somewhat old news. It's, it's, it seems like old news, but it's not even a week old yet. Um, but a couple of things that happened toward the end of last week that were really blog centric, and I think kind of deserve a discussion. Um, the first was this feud between Jamie Ratke and Eric Erickson at Red State. Um, you know, Jamie Ratke is is a Tea Party leader in Virginia. She's running for U.S. Senate against George Allen. Is not doing too well. And late last week, it broke that somehow Politico uh, received an email um, that Eric Erickson from Red State had sent Radke or the Radke campaign, where he essentially said, my bosses are huge Allen fans, uh, not just fans, they're socially connected. Uh, so I'm having to tread carefully in this, happy to help. The bottom line is that uh, Radke, I, I presume, is trying to imply that um, that the reason Red State is not is not doing more to help her, and by the way, they have helped her. She spoke at the Red State gathering I was at. I think they actually endorsed her. But um, the, I think she's trying to get at the reason they haven't sort of had a full-throated endorsement and, and push to help her is because Red State is owned by Eagle Publishing, um, who apparently has connections with with George Allen and Kristen, this opens up this whole question about, you know, blogs used to be more independent. Now, you know, townhall.com is owned by Salem and Hot Air is owned by Salem, this big sort of Christian radio station corporation. You have Red State owned by Eagle Publishing um, and I guess Phillips. And so uh, the bigger question, I guess, is um, do these bloggers have the autonomy to to do what they want. Let me throw it out to you. What, what was your take on this story? Um, so my take on the story was it, it did seem unusual and I think might have been, I think it would have been in Eric Erickson's interest early on to say, to, to sort of lay that fact out on the line. Like, I really support Jamie Radke. Here are my concerns with Perry, which he does that in a post, I think it was in January. He has a tweet in January where he says, I will do all my best to move all of heaven and earth, all of heaven and all of earth to get Jamie Radke into the U.S. Senate. Um, and so, you know, when that sort of changes um, as a result of something from the higher ups, I mean, I, I think disclosure is just always yeah. the best way to go about things. But the problem, though, is that Erickson uh, later essentially made the argument that, well, look, first of all, he endorsed her. Second of all, she just spoke at the Red State Gathering. Um, he then posted, and this is where I think he kind of made a tactical error, he, he actually posted comments that people had written about her saying that she was drunk when she spoke or that she went on. One person said they wanted to slit the wrist with the plastic fork or knife or whatever was there on the table. Um, and, and so I then Eric basically argued that he was just, you know, yes, it's true that his boss is like George Allen, but he was using that as an excuse to, like, get her off his back. And... Um, it's sort of like, I don't really want to help her, but I don't want to tell her I don't want to help her, so I'm going to say it to my bosses. I'm going to, throw, you know, I'm going to sort of blame them. 
Um, so he, of course, he never expected. And here's the other thing too: um, the fact that she leaked it, or you know, it's unclear who leaked it. Obviously, it came from her campaign. There's a guy named Dan Real who's sort of a gadfly. Uh, conservative blogger who apparently was helping her for free, who, who may or may not, I think the Red State people believe he was the yeah. the leak or, or at least the, the conduit. Um, but so what's up with leaking something to, I think I think had she leaked it to a conservative outlet or had, um, if, if there was another way, but sending it to Politico, I don't know that that's a smart way to endear yourself to conservatives. That just struck me as a bad move. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and truth be told, if you'd leaked it to, I think, another conservative blog, I mean, I don't think that Politico would have had any problem finding the story and coming after it. Um, you know, sort of like a keep it in the family kind right. of thing, you know. Never, uh, it never take sides with someone outside the family, I think, was yeah. what Don Corleone would say. <laughs> well, but, and then I guess part of this, I, I tried digging a little bit more into the story, is that Dan Real was already upset with Red State because he is, I believe, rather pro Palin. And. Um, he was upset that Red State let Perry announce at the Red State gathering. And so when Red State then went after Michelle Malkin for going after Perry, which we'll get to in a second, yeah. Real was then upset with Red State for allowing a front page blogger to go after Malkin on the front page of Red State. Um, so all very circular firing squad. Yeah, uh, and I mean, it's, in, it's obviously uh, inside baseball, but I mean, it's the weekend blogs. It's like the perfect... Yeah. Perfect for us. We, we do inside yes. baseball for a living or for at least for a hobby. Um, <laughs> but so, I mean, I think, you know, again, it, it brings up several issues. I mean, um, uh, you know, I think it raises the question of Tea Party candidates. Are they sophisticated enough to run effective campaigns? I mean, in 2010, they had the wind at their back. But here, I think she makes a rookie mistake. She brings on this sort of gadfly blogger who I think did not do her a service. Um, Number one, you know, it's, it just struck me as kind of scummy to, to take someone's personal email um, and to leak it to Politico. I don't blame Politico, by the way. They, they might think I do. I don't. I would have probably published it, too. I don't fault them. Um, I, I think the leaker is, is the problem. I don't think it was good. It, it served her. I mean, it raises the question, are these Tea Party candidates ready for prime time? It raises the, the question... Um, over, you know, the sort of corporatization of conservative blogs and bloggers. Um, John Hawkins at Right Wing News wrote a great, a couple great pieces uh, last month about this, about how the, the, the death of the independent blogosphere. Um, and I think that's a trend that we're seeing. Um, so it just it raises a whole bunch of questions, and, uh, you know, we'll see where this goes. But, but at the end of the day, I don't think it helped Jamie Radke any. No, and I, well, and I, and I you know, I, I sort of do sympathize in the sense that, you know, for, for instance, I have clients at my firm that are paying clients, you know, and so when I come on this show, I either try to avoid topics that involve them, or if one were to ever come up and just be totally unavoidable, um, like would say, you know, full disclosure, sure. X, Y, and Z, or whatever. Um, so I think that that's the way to go about it and understanding, I mean, this is not the first time, I think there was another, you know, sort of pay for play uh, allegations made about Red State and, and Eric Erickson before. So I can understand being sensitive to this and not wanting to like fuel that fire and put out there, hey, my bosses are asking me to slow down. Um, one of the things that I thought was most interesting was in when Erickson wrote about the request from his bosses, that the request, request was specifically, quote, to please go slow for once instead of shooting first and asking questions <laughs> right, later. Right, right, right. So I thought, maybe that's something you should always do. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and it's just the other thing, generally. by the way, I mean, I think he made a tactical error when he put up the, the comments that people had written about her drinking, um, because then, then he allows her to become the victim. And if we've learned anything from the Christina O'Donnell playbook, it's that they want to be the victim. So I think Eric... Um, made a tactical mistake, even though I thought he was originally in the right. And uh, then Radke, pulling another page out of the Christina O'Donnell playbook, uh, consulted attorneys who sent Eric and Eagle a letter basically claiming uh, that he was uh, libeling her um, and demanding an apology. He ended up putting up some a sort of a humorous apology um, saying that, you know, if she wasn't drunk, her speech really sucked, <laughs> essentially. <laughs> she, but um, I, I think the story, I'm guessing the story uh, 
has ended for now. Um, you are right, though, about the uh, the whole potential conflict of, in, of interest thing. I mean, I think at this point, everybody has to to one degree or another, um, you know, entangling alliances, and, and it is important to to be cognizant of it. And you, I mean, always the best thing I think is to try to avoid it because the the disclaimer thing, and I've done it a few times, but it just it really. Um, you know, every once in a while you'll be watching like Fox News and, and you hear someone say, now in fairness, my wife does work for Mitt Romney or something. And it's like, uh, it kind of slows things down. Um, so it, it's better to maybe avoid it. But I do think in the case of, of, uh, of Erickson, um, he, again, why, why is he putting this in an email, right? So he emails her. Uh, or for campaign, my bosses are huge Allen fans, not just fans that are socially connected. Uh, this puts me in a difficult position. Yeah, I mean, all this stuff, like, why would you put that in an email? Again, I'm not trying to blame them because I think he was the victim here. But um, have we, you know, have we, if we've learned nothing, it's don't, you know, don't, don't email write stuff. it down. Don't make right. a paper trail. So. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, my, my feeling in this one is, it, it does seem, it's unfortunate that he seemed very excited about this candidate at first, and now, as a result of, of one speech, I mean, I can understand if you're that candidate, and all of a sudden, you know, you've seen what Red State did to catapult some other candidates to the front of, of the, the primary field, um, you know, sort of saying, hey, you know, you said you would do your best to involve heaven and all of earth, so where where's that heaven and earth moving? Um... You know, I, I can understand the campaign in the sense that they were disappointed and expecting a little more full-throated uh, support and to find that, you know, some sort of real inside baseball moves. I mean, that's one of um, that's one of Erickson's big criticism of uh, George Allen is that Allen is, you know, an insider. I think his line was, I, I know I can trust George Allen to stand up to Barack Obama. I don't know if I can trust him to stand up to Mitch McConnell, and that's why I can't right. support him. But, one of his big knocks against Allen is already that he's so entangled in, in insidery establishment republicanism that would he be an effective voice for conservatism. Um, so I just think it's interesting that then, as a result of George Allen's entanglements with the conservative, you know, Republican infrastructure, that that's why. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, I just I think though think before shooting first. I, I think though a couple of things. One, it, it's it's it, it's naive to believe that red state that their endorsement is going to dramatically change your campaign. Mm -hmm. um, candidates who are inexperienced get these these sort of crazy notions in their mind that uh, it's sort of like an 80s movie montage, right? Have you ever seen these movies where like um, all of a sudden like a guy's a loser, but then he starts working out and it's like da 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 and he's walking down yeah. the street and like construction workers are like giving him thumbs up. Hey man, I heard you on the radio. And like all of a sudden like in a three minute montage, everything falls into place. Um, that's, that's a really quixotic viewpoint. And I think like the notion, the idea that red state supporting her is what's keeping her from, from catching fire is, is, is incredibly naive. Um, the truth is if she raised a million dollars, red state wouldn't have to, uh, question supporting her and neither would the club for growth or freedom works. They wouldn't have to wonder about their, I mean, you make your own luck, and I, I agree. Red State supports like one of the things she needs, but it's like on a list of twenty things. It's it's not the notion that they're the end all and be all, and that they're the thing stopping her. Um, when in fact they've already endorsed her and let her speak at their conference is 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 a silly notion, um, and I think it's just a, a, a matter of, of people who who don't know much about politics, haven't been involved, don't know how hard it is to actually catch fire. They have this romantic notion that all of a sudden one thing's going to happen, this tipping point, and then all of a sudden things are going to be great. It just doesn't work that way. You have to do the hard work. And by the way, she could have caught fire. It is. It, I mean, this election's still a ways off, right? I mean, she she didn't just burn this bridge. She like scorched a village by doing this, by taking something someone emailed her or her campaign in, in good faith and handing it off. Not to National Review, but to Politico, and letting that's just that is that is a scorched earth, uh, you know, just unbelievable. Now I think the odds of her catching fire are, are lessened by this. Uh, who knows? Well, she but, might but have caught fire. 
Christine O'Donnell but she wasn't was, the only one pouring gasoline on this, because now, instead of Erickson just walking away from it, has, has torched her as well. Yeah, yeah. It's just ugly. Yeah, well, so, but... Well, the, so the other yeah. thing that was Rick, you mentioned Rick Perry, this guy Dan yeah. Dan Real, uh, he may have had an ulterior motive. Well, you want to set this one up about Perry and Malkin? Um, you may be able to do it better because actually you wrote a post about this that I thought was really good about you know to what extent should conservative pundits take flack for sort of you know eating our own and right. uh, you know when we you, your post is basically should should conservative bloggers be more focused on Obama or dismantling the problems on their own side? And you said you thought it was the role of conservative bloggers to, to do that to, to set up the story. Sure. Um, Michelle Malkin, sort of upon Rick Perry's entry into the race, went on, you know, finding a series of things for which she felt were just just deal breakers. Um, one was the Gardasil uh, mandate in Texas. Um, then I believe there were some other things. He's soft. He, I'm quoting her. He's soft on illegal immigration. He's prone to crony capitalism, and he demonstrated nanny, nanny state tendencies. So yeah. So not not necessarily the kindest of words. And so <laughs> for someone who's supposed to be the conservative, the, the you know establishment conservative Romney alternative in this race now, to have Michelle Malkin come out, you know guns blazing is, was, was, I guess, sort of, you know, took a lot of folks aback. And so you had, um, you know, and, and then recently, this has even continued, I think she was on Fox News recently, and she was asked about a Politico story that alleged um, that, that Perry was not very intelligent. And her response was this sort of weak, like, well, compared to what? Um, defense, and she and she mostly trained her fire on the liberal media, and they never asked for Obama's transcripts, and it's this double standard, and et cetera, et cetera. And um, but the, the the defense of Perry was not, oh yeah, he's absolutely smart enough to play the game. It was, well, he's dumb compared to what, and so um, like what was, like what Obama said of Hillary, you're likable enough, right? <laughs> yeah, like that's not really a defense. Um, which, I mean, it's not, I, I, again, like, going back to the discussion we were having earlier, is it Red State's job to support and promote Jamie Radke? No, it was never their job to do so. In the same way, it's not Michelle Malkin's job to be, right. um, and this you is, know, to, to say that she thinks Perry's wonderful if she doesn't. And, and this is one of the, uh, one of the things that's really annoying to me, because I will get, um, well, first of all, okay, so Jamie Radke and Eric Erickson are having this fight. And people will say, guys, guys, let's just focus on beating Obama. And then uh, Michelle Malkin will say, point out some of Rick Perry's problems. Um, and by the way, I think there are, you, you don't get to be the longest serving governor in America without having some, some bad votes. Or some votes that, that, you know, or some, some of them aren't even votes. But, you know, without doing some things that some people aren't going to like. So, I mean, like, I don't think anything Perry has done that we know of is, is a disqualifying factor. But by the same token, I think it's entirely within Malkin's right to uh, point this out and, and let people know. I mean, that, that's what we do. We inform people. Um, but people will criticize Malkin and say, um, guys, why are you, why are you taking on uh, Rick Perry? We should be focused on Obama. He's the enemy here. And uh, it's, it's just a clear misunderstanding, number one, of what we do. Uh, I had the same thing when Rush Limbaugh and Mark Levin attacked me for um, pointing out all of Michelle Bachman's earmarks and her five chiefs of staff and her family's farm subsidies. Um, and not a lot of people came to my defense. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure Malkin did either, by the way. But, um, but in any event, I think Malkin is well within her rights. And uh, as I wrote, there are a lot of good, you know, it's not just about beating Obama. I mean, number one, some some of us, you know, con consider our main job to be, you know, ideas and and, and re reporting and, and, and thoughtful commentary, not activism. But even if you are an activist blogger, like say Eric Erickson or Michelle Malkin, it's still not their job um, to like look the other way and, and say and, and, and only focus on Obama. And there's actually a lot of good things that happen when um, when parties and ideologies are introspective and and do the vetting. I think it's better for Republican candidates to be vetted by the right and the left than just by the left. So.
Yeah, and I and I agree. I think that you know one of the biggest problems, if you see sort of the the track of the Republican Party over the last ten years, was almost the sort of like lack of accountability that occurred under the you know Tom Delay, Dennis Hastert era, where you know was there a loud, robust conservative blogosphere out there saying Medicare Part D? What are you guys talking about? You know, I mean, there's that, that, you know, there, that there are a lot of things that occurred under a Republican Congress that weren't necessarily, that would not be beloved by conservative bloggers today. Um, and that I think, you know, holding your own side accountable keeps them better so that when it comes to fighting the other side, they are stronger going into that battle. You know, if, if for instance, conservative bloggers, you know, do turn a blind eye to the, the potential problems with candidates on the right, I mean, you could wind up in a situation where, you know, a candidate gets further down the road, they pick up a lot of traction, a lot of traction, a lot of traction, and all of a sudden they're in a general election and the left is salivating because there's all this stuff that was just completely ignored by the right. So, I, I mean, I, I believe that, you know, I'm, I'm, well, I definitely think that, you know, for instance, in this Republican primary, like stepping back away from the role of bloggers, just in terms of candidate versus candidate, I'd always rather see things be more, uh, civil, more substantive, rather. Civil is not the word. Substantive is the word I'm looking for. More substantive than not, because mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, if if two candidates get into sort of a nasty personal exchange or a nasty substance-free exchange, that's not helpful, and that's one of those, okay, we should be focusing on the substance of why you want to beat Obama. Um, but I, I do think that when it comes to setting up contrasts, you have, I think, unique, very interesting debates within the party that ultimately make it better. And I think stepping back away from the party and going back to bloggers, I think bloggers play an important role in that, in holding people accountable to doing what they say they're going to do. Yeah, no, I, th I, th I think you're totally right. And um, the other thing, too, is, so, like, if you, if you look at my... Um, my piece on Michelle Bachman from a couple months ago, where I'm pointing, I'm pointing out things in her record that Republican primary voters ought to care about, like her earmarks, for example. Um, the mainstream media is not as likely to pick up on that. I mean, they, they would attack her on, like, really from the left, right? Like, you know, her husband's... Um, psychology practice or, or counseling practice or whatever. Um, so I think that, you know, but, but I think that it's important because um, if, 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 if the only pressure you feel is from the left, then that actually will have consequences in terms of how you campaign, how you actually conduct yourself. I mean, if we believe that politicians respond to pleasure and, pl and pain, Pleasure being, you know, like good things said about them, letters to the editor, you know, endorsements, pain being, you know, criticism, and I, I believe they do. Um, then it's important that pressure be applied from both directions, and if pressure is applied only from one direction, then that will actually have consequences. So, mm -hmm. uh, anyway, that's a long way of saying that uh, I think we all, I think you and I agree, um, and I think. Uh, these people, they, here's the thing, they think they're being so, um, they think they're being so thoughtful in a, in a weird way when they say, guys, guys, let's let's not fight amongst ourselves. They think they're being helpful, but they're not. They're, they're actually uh, very short-sighted, I think. Yeah, I agree. I think, I think a robot, I mean, if anything, I mean, look at on the Democratic side in 2008, you had this really nasty primary. You had a lot of infighting. You had, you know, bloggers tearing into, you know, one another's candidates. And yet, I think that the Democrats emerged all the stronger for it, and the left emerged all the stronger for it. And so, as long as that is the sort of play, uh, field that we're playing on, I think it's all for the best. So, what is your take, then, on, like, looking at the broader 2012 field, since it's, it's someone from the right and someone from the right... <laughs> Uh, we don't get to parse this quite as much uh, on weeks when 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 we've got Bill here. Um, so the latest polls have shown Perry surge to the front. Um, there's sort of two tiers. There's the Perry Romney tier, and then there's the other people who could potentially pull it off but aren't as strong tier, which includes folks like.
Bachman. Um, and you've seen, I think, that Perry's been peeling away what's called like the manager class, like people who are considered Romney's base, that because Perry has come out so strong on jobs, that he's been able to peel that away. Right. Um, there was a piece by Bill Galston um, at uh, New Republic about how Perry's existence could actually wind up being a good thing for Romney. Because I think the conventional wisdom now is that Perry is peeling away votes from Romney, it's, it's potentially complicating his run, that Perry is his biggest adversary. Um, but this piece, he said, Perry, this is a quote, Perry's emergence also gives you a unique opportunity to define yourself against him. If you take it, you have a fighting chance of prevailing. If you duck it, you'll lose, just as Tim Pawlenty did when he booted away his chance to take you on. Do you think that the existence of Perry in the race, I mean, I think obviously peels away some voters from Romney, and on, but on the other hand, I think there are potential ways that the Perry entrance into the race can shake up the Romney strategy so that it, it, it no longer is solely focused on pointing out how Obama has not created jobs. What's, what's kind of your take on the Perry-Romney dynamic? It's a good question. I mean, I think, um, I think that, you know, as I've always thought Perry is a great candidate because he peels away, or he can appeal to the Michelle Bachman voters and the Mitt Romney voters, right? So um, he's acceptable and palatable to Tea Party folks and, you know, sort of evangelicals, rural, southern conservatives in a way that Romney's not. Um, but he's also appealing to serious, uh, sort of um, establishment types uh, in a way that Bachman's not. So I think he can steal some people from Romney and steal some people from Bachman. And uh, so, I, I mean, I think that he's incredibly formidable. Now, how does that impact Mitt Romney? I think, I mean, I could see it going a couple ways. I mean, like, on one hand, um, you know, he could cut into Romney's base. And I think he does to a certain degree. I mean, he's the longest serving governor in America. Uh, he was head of the Republican Governors Association. So he definitely has serious, and, and don't forget about all the jobs that they created in Texas. So, I mean, he has serious governing chops. Um, so, that, so I think Romney could definitely lose some supporters, but Romney could also gain. I mean, you mentioned the, the notion that this could sort of force Romney um, to, to step up his game, I mean, that's entirely possible. Um, but the other thing I think that could happen is, is the situation whereby, you know, Perry and Bachman and Cain essentially divide up the conservative vote, mm -hmm. and Romney ends up having the sort of moderate vote all to himself. I mean, this is assuming that Huntsman doesn't catch fire, and it's assuming that Bachman and, and Cain stay in the race. And don't forget, Palin would also divide up that sort of conservative vote, too. So if Sarah Palin got in, which is still within the realm of possibility, I mean, you could imagine that Perry and Palin and Bachman and Kane kind of divide up the conservative vote and Romney kind of dominates everything else. So, um, I mean, it's just when you have these multi-candidate fields, uh, it's really hard to sort of strategize um, because it's like it's like a Rubik's cube, you know. You move one piece, and every other piece moves too. Well, and so, there's still some pieces that are up in the air. I mean, that right too, now, yeah. Got, we're juggling. What is what is Sarah Palin going to do? So that, that's that's another that's a whole other topic. Is uh, you know if if you've looked at like Quinn, like we'll just take one pollster, Quinnipiac. Um, back in November, Palin was at 19 percent in their poll. And then come May, she was 15 percent. And now in their most recent one, she's at 11. Um, now, you could say, like, the entrance of Perry may have changed that, but, you know, you also had Huckabee in some of those earlier polls. So, um, to what extent do you think that if Palin gets into this race, like, what does she do to that Perry-Romney calculus? Does she do anything to that? Because, again, I mean, Perry's beating Romney in a poll that featured Palin. Palin's was an option, and Perry still was getting 24%. So, you know, do you think that she plays a role that if she got in, it would be a boost to Romney, or um, do you think it's not? It's kind of a non-issue. Um, well, I mean, I guess there are a couple ways of looking at it, right? So one way is just looking at it as if it were a national election, and obviously, the more people 
that have the Tea Party conservative brand, the more people carving up that brand, the more it helps Romney. But as you know, the way it really works is we have a series of state elections. So, I mean, you could have a, I mean, there could be like a situation where, um, where, uh, you know, Bachman wins Iowa, Romney wins New Hampshire, Perry wins South Carolina, Palin wins. So, I mean, in that scenario, this thing could really drag on. I mean, I think more likely is that I think, I think at, the, at this point, I think it's more likely Palin does not get in, and that um, I think it's probably Rick Perry's to lose. I mean, I think that barring some shocking revelation about him, he's sort of in the driver's seat. I mean, I kind of feel like for the first time, this race has finally coalesced, and you can actually get a sense for like what direction this race is going. So I think that Perry really, his entry really did give us a um, kind of a, a much clearer picture of who, who you know. I mean, there was a point where, like, Herman Cain was in the mix and Bachman was in the mix. And, I mean, I, I, I don't think that's going to hold. I think it's really going to, you know, my guess is it becomes a Perry versus uh, Romney race. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not so sure that a Palin entry would shake that up too much. I think that that would still be the case. Because I think, I mean, you've, you've also got this this week, there's been a lot of stuff in the conservative blogosphere about this Iowa Tea Party rally, and Palin was going to speak, and then O'Donnell, Christine O'Donnell was going to, I think, in, in, introduce her or also speak or speak before her. And then Palin came out and they said, you know, sources close to Palin, uh, you know, anonymous sources, um, said that there was sort of mismanagement of the rally and Palin had not confirmed. And then Christine O'Donnell's people were saying, oh, well, we, we've been texting with Palin, we've been communicating with her, and Palin kept saying, no, that's not the case. And so yet again, circular firing squad. Um, but, you know, and there was a, a conservative blogger, Tina Corby, at um, Hot Air, who said the calculated chaos is vintage Palin. And so I wonder if just this whole dragging it out and dragging it out and dragging it out and doing the bus tour and kind of having this, this like cloud of, of drama always hanging around has just sort of exhausted people enough where if, if you, if Palin is your, your, you know, brand of vodka, that you are instead at this point going, you know what, I like Rick Perry or I like Michelle Bachman and that Palin would not surge into the race and disrupt things as much as she might have had she gotten in three or four months ago. Yeah, it's hard to say. I mean, if she gets in the race, I, I think there would be um, all bets are off, right? So she, it, the minute she gets in, all this other stuff is forgotten. And there's a huge hoopla and huge excitement. And then I think from there on, how she uh, how she campaigns is, is what matters. Does she reinforce all this stuff um, that people think about her, the negative stuff? And if so, then... then then this stuff matters because it's, it's being reinforced. But if she gets in and hits the ground running and performs well, then I, I don't think this stuff matters that much. Um, because again, you can't underestimate the impact that actually getting in the race would have. I think it covers a, a multitude of, of problems. Um, there is sort of this larger point though. I mean, this, this Tea Party thing has been a complete debacle. I think both Palin and O'Donnell were both confirmed and unconfirmed at least twice. Uh, it, it appears that that Palin's people nixed Christine O'Donnell um, from speaking. It's uh, it's this weird thing within the Tea Party where being like disorganized and incompetent is almost held up as um, as as an, an accomplishment. We're not establishment. Look at us. Right. And it, but it's almost like an accomplishment. It's like something you should be proud of. It's a badge of honor to be, the, and that's not the case. Um, Morton Blackwell, who runs the Leadership Institute, says you owe it to your philosophy to study how to win. And I think there's not, I think it's very encouraging that, that new people and fresh faces have gotten involved in politics, but they, sh but they, should, they should then strive to, um, to become technologically proficient and to become competent. And um, so while, while I don't want to, well, I think it would be a mistake to sort of like look down our noses at people who are, who are not 
a sophisticated, um, it's almost like the thing where a conservative guy says uh, to a homeless guy, you know, hey, get a job, you know, hey, get your act together, right? Same sort of thing. Like, nobody's faulting you for, um, you know, for not you know, for not being a political pro on day one, but if five years from now you're involved in politics and you still can't put together an, an event and you still can't like schedule things and and make the ship, you know, the trains run on time, you're not really helping your cause. It's just, it's a very weird notion that being disorganized is somehow a badge of honor. Well, and I think the latest sort of Christine O'Donnell, you know, kerfuffle has been another moment of sort of self-reflection for a lot of folks who support the Tea Party and, you know, identify with it, but now sort of in hindsight, you know, especially given the, the sort of performance of the book tour and all this, I've sort of looked back and said, you know, we did, we did overreach there. Yeah, you know, maybe we didn't like my castle, but like this was an example, I think it was Ala Pundit at Hot Air who said, you know, now we can look back and see that, you know, Christine O'Donnell has become synonymous with Tea Party overreach. Yeah, well, I mean, um, it, my thing, though, is, and I know some people are, are worried about the numbers, and they're saying, well, if we had supported Mike Castle, he could have been, I, I, I don't buy it, I don't, that's strategic voting, I don't care about that. My problem with O'Donnell is she's never done anything except get publicity and put down masturbation, um, which is, by the way, a fine practice, I think we could all agree. Um, but so she's never been elected. She, she runs all the time. Um, she, you know, I question the character, uh, you know, the, the, the debt, the, the foreclosures, all that stuff. And she sued a conservative organization in Delaware for millions of dollars, the, the ISI, Intercollegiate Studies Institute, for I think some gender discrimination or something, or it was something that most conservatives aren't litigious to begin with. And if they are, it's not over that. So, I mean, my point, my problem with O'Donnell was somehow um, because she adopted this Tea Party mantle, they sort of coronated her as this conservative hero. And I mean, like, what is conservative about all that? I mean... Well, and that, and that goes along with the idea of, like, what's conservative about not being able to coordinate a rally? Right. Why does that make you a better conservative? So yeah, there, there's no there's no correlation. And in fact, I could argue the opposite. But yeah, you're you're totally right. Well, so with Palin potentially, uh, you know, complicating things from the one end in the race, you do have Huntsman who is out there, and I have been uh, calling for a long while that I want some Republican somewhere running for president to come out with some a plan. This is what I want to do to create jobs. And yesterday, John Huntsman did that, um, and I think he would be the person, if he caught fire, to take the most away from Mitt Romney to complicate things from the moderate side of the Republican electorate, which, while not in vogue these days, um, you actually, I, I, sidebar, uh, there's a, so I follow Florida politics a lot, I, I mention it on this show frequently, um, that there's the primary now between George Lemieux and Adam Hasner for the Florida Senate seat. Um, to take on Bill Nelson, and there's actually now um, there was an old mail piece that one of the that Adam Hasner, who's sort of the red state endorsed candidate, uh, he sent out a mail piece many many years ago saying, you know, Adam Hasner counts his moderate record. So now the Lemieux campaign, which is already fighting the moderate label because this guy used to work for Charlie Chris. This is actually a race. Let me just say this is actually a race I can't talk about. <laughs> okay, well that's fine. Not because um, I work for them, but because a family member is involved in this. So but gotcha. go ahead and say your piece. I'm just going to sit here and, uh, and be respectful. Well, no. So my, my piece on this one is I think it's interesting that, and I think it's a very bad, bad, bad sign for John Huntsman, that in Florida, where he is sort of staking his claim, one of the biggest things in that race between two candidates is that one candidate called himself moderate some years ago, and that's being used as, like, a weapon against him. So I think that my, my, my story about that anecdote isn't to necessarily analyze that race so much as to say the perception is that the Republican electorate in a swing state like Florida would reject the moderate label out of hand, and so therefore, does John Huntsman have a prayer at all? Um, and well, I think let, let, me, let me say an interesting point. I, I thought Huntsman's... Um, uh, jobs plan was, was actually quite good. Mm -hmm. But it was funny, I, I went back 
to, um, to my blog at townhall.com when I used to work there in 2008. And uh, a lot of people know this. Rudy Giuliani actually had the best economic plan in 2008. It was really good. And I remember I was heard a lot about it and talked about it. I went on TV and talked about it on Cavuto. And um, it's just interesting that the t two guys that you wouldn't necessarily expect to be uh, at the forefront had really good plans, Huntsman and, and Rudy, the last time around. And it, hopefully it'll work, hopefully for Huntsman's sake, it'll work out better than it did for Rudy because it didn't, didn't seem to help him much. Well, and it, it, I think in order for a big plan like that to really move a campaign, it has to be the defining thing about you. And my worry for Huntsman is that the defining thing about him has already come out as, I'm the civil guy, I got a profile in Vogue, I ride a motorcycle. And that's all lovely, but, the, you know, can now that that has become, like, the thing that people associate with Huntsman, can he override that with, hey, I took... Bull Simpson and the Ryan plan and the Pickens plan and smooshed them up into one thing and that is my jobs plan. And isn't it pretty great? Um, you know, can that narrative override what he's already created for himself? Which is, and and to his credit, you know, I mean, in the debate when he got asked about something like civil unions, he stuck to his position. He didn't change his position, even knowing that that, while a very small issue in the broader scheme of things in the Republican electorate. Like, that would be something for which the media would constantly define him, for which he would be pegged as a moderate, even if his fiscal positions are firmly to the right. Yeah, um, I wrote a piece about John Weaver, Hunt, Huntsman's Karl Rove, um, and, and it just doesn't make sense. They're, they're whole, I mean, if, if you're running for the Republican primary and your entire strategy is to attract independent voters in New Hampshire, then you've got a problem. Because... It, I just don't see a path to victory, and I have no idea why. I mean, it's like Huntsman's election. The, the rationale for a Huntsman presidency was dubious to begin with. And then the, up until this jobs plan, which, again, I think was quite good, their entire messaging just strikes me as like, uh, what would you do if you if you want to lose? It's like, if you're the checklist how not to win a Republican primary, just go down the, the list, and that's what they've done. It's, it's weird. Well, and, and, and I think, like, it didn't have to be that way, too, which I think is the most... So he had some things in his past, like the, uh, you know, him... I think he did an ad with Arnold Schwarzenegger about global warming or something like that. Um, you know, but beyond the global warming and the civil unions, a lot of what he did, I mean, he was... Utah is not a swing state. It is not a moderate state. It is a very conservative state. And he was governor of that state with very high approval ratings. So I, I, I think it didn't have to be like this. And I yeah. think what's unfortunate is there's a, a vision in people's minds that in like that being conservative means you have to, you know, look and talk like Sarah Palin or you have to look and talk like Rick Perry. You have to and, and I think that well, we, there we, were things we have economically conflated. that could define conservatism that you know, I don't I don't think that Huntsman had to run away from the conservative label at first like he did. Yeah, no, I, I think you're right. Um, I think he could have run a better campaign. I think that um, I, look, I, I think there's there's this thing that I've I've pushed call that I call uh, and other people do too, uh, cosmopolitan conservatism, um, which basically says that you don't have to be stupid to to be a conservative. And I think the guy who's going to ultimately I think Marco Rubio is the guy who fits who who can advance that image. Um, I think Rubio can be the guy who is is appealing and, and acceptable to the Palin, Perry, Bachman voters, but also um, will will be palatable to urban folks and college graduates. I think he could be the guy to bridge that gap. Because there's no, I mean, the irony is that conservatism originated as an intellectual philosophy, unlike liberalism. Um, but I think over the years, this, you know, it goes back to Jonathan Martin's piece about is Rick Perry dumb? Um, this is something that the left has pushed, but it's also something that conservatives and Republicans have embraced. Um, 
because sort of perpetuating this everyman persona has, has, had, has been electorally beneficial over the years. I mean, I think Reagan was obviously very smart, but he sort of played up his um, everyman persona, and I think certainly, you know, Perry has this sort of all shucks uh, folksiness, and I think Bachman and, and Palin have both embraced sort of like anti-elitism to a certain degree, uh, even though they're probably both pretty darn smart. Um, but I think Rubio's the guy who I think can sort of bridge the gap and, and hopefully change uh, conservatism or the image of conservatism back to, uh, to something that I think uh, could have um, appeal to, to all sectors of the country and, and not just re certain regions. I think I think a, a Paul Ryan could do that as well. I mean, I think now the Ryan plan it's it's got enough political questions um, that would complicate him sort of emerging as the leader it, it, as emerging in the same role that you just defined there for Rubio. But I do think I mean, there's for all the talk that the right has become anti-intellectual. I mean, we've still got you know two professors that are up there on stage in a presidential debate. I mean, so. We or not, we have one one professor and one uh, doctor. You know, we have we, we don't have, and neither of them have a chance of winning. By the way, right? Neither <laughs> of them have a chance of winning. Um, but I don't think it's coincidental. I think it's for other reasons. I don't think yeah. it's because they are too smart for Republican primary voters. Um, I think that you know, and I and I think like even somebody like a, you know, I. I'm trying to think of like another example of someone like like a Jeb Bush. Like who would say that Jeb Bush is unintelligent? Nobody. I don't think any. Well, I'm sure people in the comments will take me to task for this one. But I mean, Jeb Bush has always been like a really bright guy. And my sense would be, is that if he got in the race, I, mean, I am totally obsessed with Jeb Bush. So um, I, maybe this is just my cosmopolitan conservatism coming out. But I, you know, I think that he is the sort of person. And, and even Perry, like so, Perry may have this Oshucks persona. But there's a whole, like, a little, like, a, a book that's now coming out about how he used social science and, like, academic practices to try to, you know, use Texas as a lab to figure out, you know, in terms of a campaign, you know, there are things that campaign consultants will always peddle. Oh, you need more direct mail. Oh, you need to right. get out the vote calls. And, like, has this actually really been tested or is this just a money pit into which campaign dollars can flow to make some consultants rich? And Perry went out and had his campaign team kind of, like, test this stuff. That's not something that a dumb candidate does. That's not something that a dumb governor does. And not only did they so, test it on his reelect, then they went and worked on a presidential race <laughs> before Perry got in. Talk oh, about that's the ultimate other. testing. But look, I, I look, I, just we should probably close out. But um, I will say this about consultants. I mean, I think that like the, I think Huntsman has probably uh, deferred too much to his strategist. Yeah. Um, and I, and I think Valenti did the same thing. Which I think was his downfall. Yeah. So, um, but anyway, uh, this has been fun. I think uh, this has been great, and uh, good, yeah. So I, I always look forward to, to diving in strictly to the, the the ins and outs of the righty blogosphere with you. So thanks for uh, thanks for chatting. Yes, uh, likewise, uh, and I guess who knows if Bill will be back, but I guess he'll be back. Uh, one of us will be back with him next week. I, I don't yep. know. So. <laughs> and, uh, so yeah, you can uh, again. I'm Kristen. You can catch my stuff at kristensoltis.com and Matt. And uh, yeah, check me out at mattlewis.org and at Matt K. Lewis on Twitter. Thank you, uh, San Diego. <laughs> All right. Have a great week, All Matt. Right. You too.